Pacific Learning's publisher for Asia and global uh, markets. He has been with National Geographic Learning for over 15 years and has been the publisher of Time Zones in its first, second, and now third editions. A former English language teacher, he has given presentations and workshops at language teaching conferences across Asia, as well as North America and South America. Andrew has two master's degrees, including one in creative writing. He is also an award-winning creative writer, a short story writer. He is currently based in Singapore, where he works on the development of new products for the global ELT market, including print and digital components for students and instructors. So please, everyone, join me in welcoming Andrew to today's session. Hey, welcome, everyone, and thank you very much for that introduction, Anders. Um, I was going to say good morning, but I realize people are calling in from all over the world. Uh, I've, seen, I've been looking at the chat and seeing, you know, we've got people from Europe, we've got people from uh, Latin America, from the US. Maybe we could start, if you could just maybe let me know in the chat box, just type in where are you and what time is it where you are? Where I am, it's 8 a.m. in Singapore. So we've got 8 a.m. in the Philippines, we've got 9 p.m., 7 p.m. in Mexico. There's a lot of people on this chat, so the chat's going to go quite quickly. Uh, yeah, we've got some crazy times, 3 a.m. <laughs> Thank you for calling in at 3 a.m. I noticed someone earlier was calling from Germany, where I assume it's around that time as well, maybe 2 a.m. We are Romania, 3 a.m. So thank you for your dedication. Um, uh, that's great. Well, that's very much in keeping with the, the theme and the philosophy behind time zones, which, of course, is a, is a very outward-looking, very international program. Um, I'd like to start, we have a few interactive features on this uh, software that Anders mentioned, and I'd like to start by testing out a few of those. We've got more than 100 people here now. My first question to you, which will come up on screen in a few seconds, if you look at these pictures on the screen, um, which I hope you can see, I hope the chat is not blocking that, uh, can, I'd like to ask, can you do these things? Can you name the eight planets in the solar system? Can you play a musical instrument? Can you remember the Sony Walkman? Can you bake cakes? You've got a chat box. Yep, I think everyone's got the hang of it. So we've got this poll going on. I'm going to give that a few more seconds. It's looking like most people can name the planets. Most people can remember the Walkman, which tells me a little bit about the age group of the people I'm talking to. Uh, the lowest one seems to be playing an instrument. Yeah, I'm with you on that. I can't play an instrument either. I can't tell whether you can see the results of that chat or not, uh, of that poll or not. They can't. Great. Okay. Well, all right, let's move on to the next question. I've got two more questions for you. The next question is a have you ever question. Sorry, I've got to move the slide. My mistake. Have you ever uh, been skydiving? Have you ever visited Europe? Which some of you obviously live there. Have you ever tried Chinese medicine? Ever seen a wonder of the world? Ever been camping? So that little poll is going to come on screen. Please check the ones you've done. And we'll give everybody just 10 seconds or so to answer that. And you can see the results as they're coming in. So, yeah, most people have been camping. The lowest is gone skydiving, which is the same as uh, same as the result we had last night. Personally, I have done all four of these things. Uh, sorry, four of the five of these things. I've not been skydiving. A little bit scared of heights. Most people have seen at least one wonder of the world. All right, let's move to the last question. Now, this question's a bit different. Here you get just one choice. You're going to have a, uh, you've got six animals on screen, and I want to ask you which one is your favorite, but you can only check one of these six. So take a good look at these animals and vote on your favorite.
<laughs> yeah, I think last night we had a similar result. Sorry, Emily, I can't quite see the bottom of that poll. Do you mind moving it up a bit? Thanks. Looks to me like the koala is the most, sorry, the panda is the most popular with the koala. Not many, not many tree frog fans. Personally, my favorite is the hedgehog, at least in this photograph. But yeah, no big surprises. Everybody likes pandas. Lots of people like koalas. I'm seeing a couple of comments about the the, uh, the lag, the technical issues, which I think uh, either Emily or Anders may be able to address. Okay, so those of you who are familiar with time zones, you'll probably guess that the photographs I showed you just now are all taken from the third edition of time zones. And the questions that I asked you are also taken from the grammatical syllabus. So I'm going to just talk for a couple of seconds about Time Zones, the series. As Anders mentioned, I'm the publisher of Time Zones, and I've been the publisher for the entire life of the series. We're now entering the third edition. The first edition is now 10 years old. We started work on this in 2008, and then about every five or six years, we create a new edition of a series. So some of you may be more familiar with this, which is the second edition of Time Zones. This is the one that's currently in use. And I'm here today to talk about the third edition, which we're just publishing now. And that's right here. So before we get into the session, I'd just like to ask you one more poll. I'd just like to know what, which of these three statements describes you the best. Are you currently a user of time zones? Are you someone who's used it before, but you don't use it now? Or have you never used it? Yeah, so we're getting quite a similar result to the session that we ran last night, which is that quite a large percentage of people have never used time zones and you're not familiar with the series. Because of that, um, Anders has prepared a short video, just two minute video, which we will play now just to give you a general introduction to the series. Of course, I will talk more about it, but um, since many of you don't know the second edition, you might find this video quite useful. Um, when we play videos, we do sometimes have a little bit of trouble. Some people have a bit of a lag and have some connectivity problems. So please bear with us if this doesn't come through perfectly.
Okay. Can everyone hear me now? Okay, great. Yeah, I think the internet connect. Uh, the, sorry, the the video sometimes causes a few issues, but uh, I think the rest of the presentation should be just fine. So that's a little brief introduction to time zones. And before I get into the bulk of the session, I just want to talk about the the publishing process a little bit. Um, when we publish a series like time zones, we we usually, it takes us maybe two, two and a half years to do something like that. And then almost immediately when the new edition is published, we we start researching the next edition. So we're constantly um, talking to teachers, uh, conducting surveys, ideally flying to places and meeting teachers and students and and, give, and trying to get feedback to, to improve and refine a series every five or six years. So we've been conducting um, surveys with teachers now on time zones for at least about two to three years, I think, in various places. We've also visited a lot of these places before um, COVID. We've got a panel of experts, a panel of academic consultants who give us advice. And then we also have our international editorial team. My personal team is based in Singapore, but we have representatives all around the world and from all over the world. So we have a lot of feedback and we have, a, I think, quite an international team to look at and respond to this feedback. And what I'm here to do today is really to tell you about the things teachers told us about the current edition of Time Zones, the second edition, and how we have address those things for the third edition. So I've broken everything we heard down into three areas, which I'm going to tackle one by one in the course of the next 30 minutes or so. And I'm just going to get right into it and talk about the things that we have updated in time zones. Now, when I say updated, what I mean is that teachers told us already that they they like this element of time zones. They don't really want any changes. We've simply taken the same aspect and enhanced it or made some small um, tweaks. So one of the first things that teachers always say they like is the time zones design. And you know we are National Geographic Learning. We're affiliated with the National Geographic Society. Design is very important to us. Photography is very important to us. So you'll notice that in all our books, we, we tend to privilege these very large photographs. We try to make the photographs very central. And we try to really create space within the books to maximize the use of, of photo images. You can see on the, on the left is the second edition. Let me get this pointer up. The second edition on the left, the third edition on the right, they're not very different. As I say, teachers already liked the second edition, so there was no need to, to dramatically change this. I do prefer the third edition. I think what we've done is we've made an effort to try to take things like this text box away from the image. It's part of the National Geographic design philosophy to try not to block an image with other things. So in the third edition, you see there's more, there's more clear space, I think, for the image with the text just coming across the side like that. It's a small change, but I think it's a slight improvement. Or here, we have an example, uh, the second edition again. I think it's just a little bit cleaner in the third edition without this box kind of blocking a little bit. Also, Five years goes by between editions. I don't think this photograph of the narwhals here was available five years ago. So we've, we've got access to all that new photography that was not available before. So just staying on the theme of design, um, here's an example of a reading passage from the second edition and the third edition. Again, talking about National Geographic design philosophy generally, if we have a choice between one really big impactful image like this or several small images, 
we would choose the one big impactful image. Um, sometimes there is a reason to have more than one image. Uh, there could be a pedagogical reason, but usually, given a choice, I would prefer one big photograph, and that would be consistent with with National Geographic itself and the magazine. So you might see a small evolution that way in the third edition. But again, these are small changes. You can see the second and third edition of this reading passage, same topic, slightly different design. I prefer the new design. I didn't quite like how this was blocking the image again. Or how about here, where we have a, a really spectacular photograph of this temple, but I don't think we make quite as much use of it as in the second edition as we did in the third, where we managed to put the text on top of the image, and you can really see more of this, this Mayan temple in Guatemala. Now, for anyone who's familiar with the second edition, you may know that a unit of time zones was 10 pages long. In the third edition, it's 12 pages long, which might not seem like a big change, but from an editor's perspective like mine, that gives us a lot of extra space to play with. So, for example, this uh, design of the video page in the second edition it always felt a little bit squashed to me. We only have one page. We don't have much space. We've got limited activity types that will fit within that space. But in the, th uh, the third edition, we've, we've added this extra bit of space, which is only about one third of a page, but it, it gives us just more flexibility to open up this page a lot, to add one activity, and to more importantly, to add a greater variety of activities. So that's given us a lot of additional um, opportunity. Like this is a brand new activity type for this unit, uh, for this edition. Okay, so the second big thing that teachers told us pretty uh, unanimously that they liked was the topics. You may have got the sense from watching that video earlier that at National Geographic Learning, we feel very strongly about teaching real-world information, real-world topics. Uh, this is, of course, primarily for teenagers, so we try to teach them about things that are relevant to them, um, whether those, whether it be conservation or learning about animals or learning about other parts of the world. One thing we don't like to do is to make up content just for the sake of teaching language. So real world authentic information is really at the core of what we do. There are some small tweaks to the third edition. For example, here, um, where's my pointer gone? Here we have in the second edition, two units back to back, which is, um, they're both about animals. So unit two is about land animals. Unit three is about sea animals. Some teachers complained that uh, some teachers said that that was challenging for their students. It, too much animal vocabulary back to back. It was a lot of uh, it was a significant um, burden on the students. So I think that's a good point. So what we did was we took the most uh, popular unit, which was about the land animals, and we've made that the focus of our unit, which teaches prepositions of place. So where is the lion? And then uh, the other topic, which was grammatically, it was about teaching adjectives. It was about teaching uh, students how to describe amazing things. We've made this unit about places rather than animals. So we, we can talk about amazing um, beaches, tall buildings, uh, fantastic scenery. And this is where we can bring in things like, <clears throat> things like the wonders of the world. So we get some really spectacular photographs in there. Um, you know, sometimes topics just date. It's been five years. In fact, it's been more like six or seven years since we were working on the content for the second edition. In those days, some of you may remember that Psy was pretty popular, uh, Gangnam Style. I think this was 2012, and then we started working on the second edition around 2014. So he was quite a good topic five years ago. I don't think he's a very good topic today. 
people don't really remember him. So um, we changed this a little bit to talking about old technology and new technology, things that maybe teachers and parents will remember and things that students may not remember. Or here, uh, some of you might have followed the news last year about this discovery of the fossilized dinosaur. This was very recent, so we couldn't have had this in the last edition. But for this edition, we found a way to get this into our unit, which talks about discoveries and dinosaurs. And we've got these really spectacular images of these of this um, incredibly preserved um, dinosaur skeleton. Now, I'm going to talk later about the uh, the real world section specifically, but just to give you a little um, spoiler on this, this is one of the big changes to the new edition. We've gone from the real world being a audio only activity where students listen to information to a video activity where students watch information. And because of that, some of the real world topics had to change because you can't watch. Some topics really lend themselves to watching. Some of them you can't really watch. This is a good example of something you couldn't watch. We're talking about a proposed building in Mexico City that hasn't been built yet. So you can't really watch a video about a building that hasn't been built yet. You can watch a building, uh, a video about a the world's longest footbridge, which is in Switzerland. And there's some very spectacular footage of people walking across this bridge, which is very high up. It's a bit difficult for some people to watch, actually, if you're a bit scared of heights. And then sometimes we just find, uh, you know, bet I think better or newer ways to deal with the same topic. This is the food unit from level two. Uh, I think we have quite an ordinary photograph for the second edition, but in the third edition, there's a National Geographic explorer called Matthew Paley, um, who you could actually Google. He's uh, he's a specialty. He goes around the world meeting with indigenous uh, cultures and looking at the food that they eat and taking photographs of them. And he has like a food blog. And he has several talks that you can watch online. Here's some really delicious looking images of food. And we've used some of his composite images here uh, to show locally sourced food from around the world. So to me, this is a much more interesting way of dealing with the same topic. But fundamentally, the language is similar. All right, and the other thing that teachers gave us very positive feedback on was the international approach of time zones. Um, this is something that's always been important to us ever since the first edition. Even the name, the title, time zones, has always been a kind of suggestion that we don't see English as a as a language of um, the US and Britain. We never did. We see it very much as an international language, and that is absolutely the way the world is going. You know, with every new edition, every five years, the data on this just becomes more and more um, extreme. I mean, this data that I'm showing you right now is even, I think, a bit out of date. If anything, the number of non non-native speakers is, is even bigger and the percentage of native speakers is even smaller. But in any case, those terms, native speaker, non-native speaker, are quite unhelpful. And um, the suggestion that someone is a competent English speaker just because they speak, uh, they're a native speaker is, is clearly not accurate. The idea that the native speaker model is the aspiration for all English learners I think is completely wrong. Um, I could do a whole separate presentation on this, but I don't want to spend too much time on it. But what I will say is that in this new edition, we've gone even further, I think, in that direction. Um, just a little chart to show you. I asked my editorial team to put together a chart that shows the percentage of the speakers on our new audio program for student book three. Um, you can see that the American speakers are only about one third. So, you know, we never wanted this to be a program where students only get exposure to just listening to American accents. We want them to listen to British accents. We want them to listen to South African, Australian accents. And we want them to listen to people speaking English 
who have a Korean accent or a Spanish accent or a Chinese accent. We've always done this, but I know that we've done it more in the third edition. So you can see that. Yeah, I see someone in the chat saying that they love Nadine's accent. Nadine is uh, one of the characters from Time Zones, and she's from South Africa. And that was always very important to us. And we, we had... We, we do have a, a South African actress who does her voice, you know. We did not want somebody faking an accent. That was something that, to me, was not acceptable. And again, I'm not going to spend a long time about talking about this, although I could. Um, but I completely agree with, uh, or at least I think there's a lot of truth in things like this. Something I found on the BBC a while ago, a uh, study that suggest that some of the world's worst English communicators are actually native speakers. Totally agree. Um, I think the the notion that being a native speaker is some sort of model to aspire to is is completely flawed. But I think I think this is old news at this point. I think people know this. All right, so I'm going to move into the second part of my section where we talk about areas of time zones that we have enhanced. Um, when I say enhanced, what do I mean? I'm talking about areas that already existed, but teachers clearly told us they could use more support. So, for example, the grammar sections. If you look here, I have a grammar chart from the second edition and a grammar chart from the third edition. Third edition here. You can probably see a couple of changes right away. Um, first of all, there's this uh, meta language descriptor up at the top of the box, which we didn't previously provide. Um, some teachers did say that that was helpful for their students. But perhaps even more significant is this brand new activity we never had before. So those of you who are familiar with time zones, you know that we have a, a mostly deductive approach to the grammar. We teach the grammar and then we have a lot of grammar practice in use, grammar practice in context. What we've never had before is a concept checking task in which students um, figure out the rules of the grammar and, and they test their understanding of the rules of the grammar. So now we're, we've got both that sort of inductive approach and the deductive approach. I'll give you a couple more examples. The task itself might be different. So it, in this case, we have a matching task. In this case, we have a true and false task, but the principle is the same. We're asking students to concept check whether they truly understand the grammar rules. So that's in terms of grammar presentation in the student book. But um, I think when teachers talked about grammar support, often, and I think someone said this in the chat, it's not just about how we teach the grammar, it's just about practice. It's just providing students with lots and lots of practice. So we have that support in the print workbook, which is a little bit bigger this, this time around compared to the second edition. And we have a lot of grammar practice there. But what I really want to talk about is this, the online practice. Now, this is something that is new to the new edition of Time Zones. In the second edition, we, we had an online workbook and we had a print workbook, but the content of the two was the same, but just that the the delivery was different. But for the third edition, we have completely separate content. So you can do the you can have your students do the print workbook, and you can have them do the online practice. All the content is different, and because they're different mediums, we've we've played to the the strengths. So in the online practice, you'll see a lot more. Uh, listening and video, for example, um, and in the print workbook, you'll see more reading, more writing, all the things that really lend themselves to the print medium. Yeah, and of course, at this time during the uh, the lockdowns and the COVID crisis, online practice is more important than ever. I just wanted to tell you this little anecdote. It's not... Uh, when I was putting together these slides a couple of weeks ago, I received this email from... Uh, well, I thought it was from PayPal, saying that my, my account had been hacked. 
and obviously my first reaction here, and I'm, I bet you've all received emails like this before, my first reaction here was to panic a bit and think, oh, you know, someone's hacked my PayPal account, someone might be going around, um, you know, making all these fraudulent purchases using my credit card. I read the email a bit more carefully, started to see these these grammatical errors in the email, which was the first clue I had that maybe this was not a genuine email. Um, now, I thought that was just me. I mean, I'm a professional editor. I'm a bit of a grammar nerd, so I notice things like this. But I went to the PayPal website, and surprisingly, that's one of their main bits of advice for figuring out online fraud. Read the email carefully. Look for grammatical errors. Sometimes look for uh, spelling errors. And it's not just PayPal. I went to my banks, and I went to a couple of other you know, organizations like this. Checking the grammar is actually one of the, the primary ways that you can tell when something is a scam. So, you know, good to have the knowledge of grammar just for situations like this. Okay, the other thing that, peop uh, that teachers asked us about was vocabulary. Uh, they did say that sometimes students could use more support here with, um, with building vocabulary. So here's an example of something that is new to the second edition. If you are familiar with it, we never really taught vocabulary explicitly through the reading sections. But now we have these red words. We introduce about six new words in every reading passage. And if you look at the, the activity spread that follows the reading, this is completely new. This vocabulary section is completely new. And in that section, we have two activities. The first one is kind of like a straight vocabulary activity. We take six words from out of the reading. We make sure that at the right level, in terms of CEF level, and we test those words. But the second section, the B section, this is where we focus a little bit more on um, vocabulary building. So in this case, we talk about synonyms. Let me show you a few more examples. We might have something like suffixes, prefixes, and have students do a task on that. Or we might do lexical sets, where we have a number of words that all naturally go together. Or synonyms, homonyms. Or lastly, collocations. Collocations are kind of fun to work with. I want to show you an example in a minute. Um, as editors, we work a lot with corpuses or corpora, so we can really see almost scientifically how people use language. So let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. I, I put a word into the corpus, a noun into the corpus, because I wanted to see what adjectives people usually use with this noun. And then I created a wordle from the results. So you can see that the most common adjective people use with this noun is troubled but they also use rebellious, they use awkward, bored, sullen, depressed. Can anyone guess what the noun is? Yeah. Uh, I think people guess straight away that the, the, the noun is teenager, which seems a little harsh to me. I don't know about what you, what you think. There are, um, there's a lot of words up here, and almost none of them are positive. There's one or two very small positive words, but they're almost all negative adjectives. So whenever people talk about teenagers, they, they almost always talk about them in a negative light. This is the kind of thing that you can learn from a corpus. You wouldn't necessarily know that yourself. And then, you know, continuing with this idea of vocabulary, um, more practice, of course, more practice in the print workbook, and more practice on the online practice. And uh, moving quickly to the writing section, this is it's quite a small part of the student book, and it remains quite a small part of the student book. But teachers did mention that they felt in the second edition the writing was a little bit, um, it was dealt with a little bit briefly in the student book. So we've, we've tried to scaffold and stage the activity in the third edition. But I think maybe more than that, um, is the support we've given in the in the workbook. 
where, where we take a more process writing approach to the teaching of vocabulary, uh, of writing, sorry. And of course, yet more practice and support for the writing in the online practice. Okay, so into my last section here. This to me is probably the most interesting section because this is the stuff that's absolutely brand new to this third edition of Time Zones. And we're at 40 minutes, so I'll try to go quite quickly. I think there's um, something I've mentioned earlier about task variety. I mentioned how we have more space in the third edition, which gives us more opportunity to give a different range of activities. But beyond uh, task variety, I think there's a big emphasis we heard from teachers on um, exams and exam tasks. So we really tried to explicitly introduce as many tasks for students that they might encounter in high stakes tests. You know, we talked to a lot of teachers about the tests that they were taking, whether it was the MET or the TOEFL Junior, or in some cases they were looking at CAT, PET, IELTS. We looked at those activity types. Some of them already appeared in time zones anyway, but those that didn't, we tried to more consciously bring in. But on top of that, we tried to support teachers in the teacher's edition by giving information about these exam tasks. So that might be exam strategies, or it might just be uh, explaining the best ways to prepare students for these kind of tasks. Let me just show you how that works in practice. So here's a reading passage from the third edition. And then after the reading passage, you have some multiple choice questions. Obviously, multiple choice is a very standard uh, activity type. But not all multiple choice questions are the same. Um, some of them have three options. Some have four. Uh, there are some certain differences, and there are uh, strategies and there is information that we can share with teachers about how to prepare students for multiple choice questions or here uh, flow charts or in this case timelines so just giving a bit of information about where students might encounter those exam task types and I guess you know by now I'm going to say that you get yet more practice of exam practice in the workbooks, the workbook and the online practice. OK, so moving on to learner autonomy. This was something, again, that teachers felt quite strongly about. And it's something we've been hearing about a lot over the years. Um, to give students a little bit more uh, autonomy, a little, little bit more accountability for their own learning. So when I put up the images of the preview spread before, you may have noticed this new section of the unit goals, which was not there before. This is just to get students thinking right at the start of the unit about the unit outcomes and what they hope and expect to learn during the unit. And when they get to the end of the unit, after the video section, we have this brand new section here, the review spread, in which they get to practice their uh, grammar and vocabulary and consolidate the language they learned in the unit along with a self-check where they can actually reflect and think about whether they achieved the learning outcomes for the unit. And then of course if we're talking about learner autonomy it makes sense to talk again about things like the online practice which students can do outside of class time by themselves. OK, so we're moving on to maybe the biggest change of the new edition and something that I mentioned earlier. Uh, before I get into it, I just want to ask you a question. Um, this is not about time zones. So recently I saw an advertisement for this podcast in which two famous English footballers, soccer players, they, they talk in a podcast about their favourite 10 goals ever scored in the Premier League. And uh, that sounds like something that I would be interested in because I like podcasts. 
I like listening to podcasts. I also like soccer. I like football. So that sounds like something I should be interested in. Um, however, I did not listen to it. I did not download it. I'm just wondering if anyone can guess why why this did not interest me. There was something about the idea of a podcast about soccer or about top 10 goals in soccer that just didn't really appeal to me. Can anyone guess in the chat what why I wasn't interested? Yeah, Yvonne, you want no visual, not visual, perfect. Yeah, that's exactly right. I think the topic is interesting. The format is interesting, but you don't really want to listen to people describing goals, right? You want to actually watch them. If this was a video, I would have watched it, but it was a podcast. And we hear similar things from teachers about the real world section in the second edition. This is the section where we really bring in uh, things like National Geographic Explorers, or we bring in things like real world, things like weather phenomenon, or in this case, we're talking about food styling, you know, how advertisers get food prepared for, for adver advertisements. These are all things that you would like to watch. They're not really things that are very difficult to listen about. Um, so that is the biggest change, I think, for the new edition. If you look on the left, we have this content from the second edition where we talk about a, a guy who's a uh, disease expert. Actually, he does really interesting work, but I think it's quite difficult to just listen about it. In the new edition, this is now a video. Uh, strangely enough, it's a video about um, epidemics, <laughs> and we chose that video maybe about a year and a half ago, so long before the coronavirus, where we talk about things like the Spanish flu of 1917. We now have about a page and a half instead of just this little section for activities. So we've got a, a much bigger space to exploit. And I'm actually going to show you now one of the sample videos from the new edition, the sample real world videos. This is a two part video and it's from the unit where we're talking about appearance. So we're talking about describing people. We're saying people have long hair, short hair, um, you know, blue eyes, brown eyes, that really is a topic that you should be watching, right? Not listening to. So I'm going to play the first half of that video now. Just watch the video. There are, there's a few questions afterwards, but all you really have to do is watch. Eric's going to perform a few tricks for you and our volunteers. And while he works his magic, we want you to pay attention to his face because it'll be important later. Uh, do you guys like magic? Yeah. Oh, watch this. Ready? Okay. Uh. Uh. Oh. 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 It hurts so much. Oh, my God. Oh. 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 Nose trick. <laughs> <laughs> so for the next few tricks, um, I really want you to pay attention to my face. Really memorize the features. Don't let me distract you by doing things like this. <laughs> Remember, pay attention to Eric's face. Don't let him distract you with his tricks. You probably have a pretty good sense of what I look like. I'll take one last look, because we're about to test you on how well you can describe my face by playing a little game. <laughs> okay, I hope most of you managed to see that video properly. Let's just do this little activity together before we play the second half. Um, so just very quickly, what do you remember about Eric's face? So true or false, Eric has short blonde hair, true or false? Maybe just type in the chat there. False, yeah, I think people are saying false, which I think is correct. Did he wear glasses? True, false, did he wear glasses? No. Brown eyes? Brown eyes, number three. I think people are saying yes to the brown eyes. And then lastly, did he have freckles? 
true or false? He has freckles. Yeah, I think people are going with false. So we have a little a little recollection of how Eric looked. Now let's watch the second half of the video. There's actually a task for you to do while you watch. Um, it's quite challenging, but give it a go. Let's play. Oops. Let's play part two of the video. We'll start with the eyes. Which pair do you think belongs to Eric? Would you say it's A, B, C, or D? Got your answer? If you said D, you're correct. What about his hair? Do you think the correct match is choice A, B, C, or D? If you said A, you got it right. Now for the nose. Can you tell which of these four choices belongs to Eric? Figure it out? The correct answer is D. Okay, lastly, the mouth. Which smile do you think is Eric's? Got your answer? If you said B, you're correct. How'd you do? Did you match all of the correct facial features? All right, that was quite hard. Um, but you know, I don't think there's anything wrong in the classroom with a slightly hard video task. You can watch it multiple times. You can do it with uh, your whole class as a whole. Um, it, it's not necessarily, you know, it's not that everybody has to get all the answers right first time. So I think okay, kind of a fun task, but quite challenging. So I'm going to pass over to Anders in a second. I just want to talk very quickly about the starter level before I go. This is also something that we have changed in the new edition. For anybody who does have absolute beginner students, the starter level is uh, really basic information such as learning the alphabet, numbers, um, days of the week. The, the thing that teachers told us about the second edition was that for one thing, Starter only had three units, which made it a bit hard to place in uh, in programs. And also, the format of those units was different to the format of the rest of time zones. So that was a little bit of a challenge. For the third edition, we've addressed both those things. So you can see the, the third edition is now a full split. It's six units long. So it should be the same length as half of a standard book with a workbook. And also the unit format is exactly the same as the unit format of all the other levels. So you start with the preview, with the unit goals. You then go on to the grammar, the language focus, followed by the real world with the video that I mentioned. So the brand new video here, then your communication task, the reading passage, along with the brand new vocabulary section that I talked about and then the writing and then lastly you get the closing unit video along with the review and the self-check so exactly the same format as the rest of the book and that is the point where I'm going to pass over to Anders who's just going to walk you through some of the practicalities of the digital support Okay, thank you so much, Andrew. And thank you to everyone who's been participating in the chat. It's very nice to see some, some friendly names there. So digital support has always been an important part of our programs at National Geographic Learning. We've always included a variety of resources to help you make the most of some of the audio content and video content that Andrew has just walked you through. Uh, but especially in light of the challenges we've all faced over the last six or seven or eight months, uh, it, it's pretty clear to see now that technology is, is really absolutely critical. 
And really, it's about flexibility. How can we make sure that our programs are fully supported no matter what your teaching circumstances are, whether you are teaching 100% remotely or you're following a, a more blended model where you're having in, in-person lessons, but you want to support that with um, homework that's done uh, online. And the, the great thing about Time Zones Third Edition is that we do have digital resources to support you at every step of the teaching and learning process. So this is where we, we really like to start when we think about the materials that we are going to develop in support of a curriculum like Time Zones. We think about what students need for homework, what they need for self-study, what teachers need for in-person live lessons, what they might need for uh, assessment. So those of you who are familiar already with the second edition, you may already know a little bit about the online workbook on my ELT. This was the LMS that we've used for many years to deliver online practice content to students. We are actually moving away from this platform in the new third edition to something that we're calling simply the online practice platform. Um, this is a brand new platform that does everything that my ELT used to do. So it delivers practice material for students to support what they're doing in the student's book. And that practice includes audio and video. But what's great about this new platform is first and foremost, it's been designed to work on whatever type of device students are working from. So if they're working from their mobile phones or a tablet device, they'll be able to have a, a really great experience regardless. Now, what I'm showing you on the screen now is some early um, development prototypes of some of the digital resources. So I'm actually going to um, start with this tab. What you can see here are activities that align with every lesson from the student's book, like Andrew just mentioned. And just like with my ELT, you can click onto any of these activities and you can complete the work that uh, aligns with what's being taught in the student's book. So here is one example. It is a simple um, matching exercise where we have an image and then we have some questions. Is the giraffe next to a monkey? No, it is not. Are the zebras in front of the giraffe? Yes, they are. And then I'll just do this quickly. And just like with my ELT, I can check my answers. I can see the correct answers. All of this content is uh, able to be assigned by a teacher as um, homework. So you can say, I want you to complete this exercise by a particular date. And it's monitored in a gradebook. In addition to this online practice content, this platform uh, it has been developed to actually be a, a hub for teachers and students. So in addition to these online practice activities, students will also have available to them a student's ebook, which is a digital version of their printed course book, along with all of the audio and video they would need to engage with the content. On the teacher side, along with having the ability to assign work and monitor progress through a gradebook, teachers will also have available to them a streaming version of the classroom presentation tool. Now, the classroom presentation tool is extremely powerful. This is a resource that in the past has been delivered via USB, and we will still have a USB option for anyone who's concerned about their in-class connectivity. Uh, but this tool is used to encourage a, a heads up classroom. So you'll have access to all of the students book and workbook content. And this, you can actually use this to <clears throat> teach from, excuse me. So whether you're working in a physical classroom or you're teaching through software like Adobe Connect or Zoom, you'll be able to present something to your students. All of these activities are fully interactive. So you can invite students to an interactive whiteboard or share your screen control in Zoom and students can complete these activities. You'll have all of the audio. You'll have all of the video content, everything you need to carry out an effective lesson. 
In addition to the student book content, you also have access to all of the workbook content. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if students are completing their homework in their printed workbooks, you can still check these activities with them. You can still do everything you need to do to ensure that students are staying on task, completing the work, and following along with the lesson. So there's a really great um, component array that supports the curriculum within time zones. And we, we feel really encouraged that these will be um, something that will you'll all be able to make great use of. So the only thing that will not be accessible through the online practice platform is the exam view assessment suite. This is a separate piece of software that allows you to create and customize your own tests and quizzes based on a pre-written bank of test items. So Andrew and his team have written exam items that correlate perfectly to what students will be doing uh, in their in-person uh, in lessons, their live lessons. And you'll be able to adapt those to your own needs, create multiple versions. If you're bringing in outside content that you want to assess, you can write your own items. It's extremely powerful, and that will be available for free as a download from the Instructor Companion site. Um, so all of this together uh, really creates a complete package. And if you have any questions about this new platform or how all of these pieces work together, um, you, can, you can visit our website at eltngl.com for some general information. And I would also encourage you to reach out to your local uh, in-region National Geographic Learning representation. Um, they will be able to provide you with demos to give you information about um, live dates and availability because this is all still currently in development throughout 2020. Um, it will be available the second half of this calendar year. Um, they'll also be able to give you uh, information about things like uh, pricing as well. So this, I will also, I will just finish, and I know that we are right bang up on time by saying that this online practice platform is also available for a number of primary programs that we publish at National Geographic Learning. Um, and so we do have, uh, this is just one example of the technology support, but we have similar resources for all of the materials we publish from very young learners to young learners, teenagers, and adults. Um, and I think with that, we can maybe hand over for maybe 30 seconds of questions, and I apologize. But I will answer one that I see right off the top um, from Sylvia. Hi, Sylvia. Nice to see you. Um, we'll be ready to use in January 2021. That is accurate. Everything will be available by 2020. Um, and we can certainly um, put you in touch with the team in your region for more information about that. It's so nice to see you. Hello. That was actually... Question about the certificate will be sent. No, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, go Andrew. Ahead. And just... Please. No. We will be sending along a certificate of attendance for this particular webinar, along with the slides and recordings within five business days. So early next week, you, you will have all of those resources. Yeah, I was just going to say there was one more question just about the online practice content. Uh, I mentioned earlier, this is completely unique content from the workbook. So anything you do in the student book and then the print workbook and the online practice, it's all unique content. It just gives students a lot more opportunity to practice. I think my dog is coming home, so this would be a good time <laughs> to wrap up. But thanks, everybody. Thank you for waking up for this, or thank you for staying up for this. It's been, it's been great. It's great to have people attending from all over the world. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Also, just a couple more things. If you're interested in attending more webinars, you can visit us at ELT, uh, eltngl.com slash webinars to see the rest of our programming. You can follow our blog at eltngl.com slash infocus. And we invite you to join our community of English language teachers on all of our social channels. We hope to uh, see you all and engage with you all in those areas. Uh, and lastly, you will be directed now to a, a survey. Please let us know uh, what you thought of today's session. And, and we look forward to seeing your feedback there as well. Thank you very much. Have a lovely day or a lovely end to your day. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Cheers.